going to walk through a, our message this morning, and I just put some extra things down there for you to connect with and follow along with us as we're continuing the process of going through Mark chapter 12. We find ourselves in the 18th verse in verses 27 and following as we walk through this. Now, there's a couple things that I want to just bring to your attention is one of the things that we've been noting as we walk through everything is that there is this sense of we're in the midst of a lot of winds that blow around. Last week, we talked about some of those political winds that exist out there. And how difficult it can be to kind of navigate that. And Jesus spoke into the political winds of his time when he was asked a trick question about taxes. You know, should we pay this census tax? And in the minds of the revolutionaries, the ones who considered themselves the true, pure Jews, it would have been absolutely horrible to pay that tax. And Jesus comes back with an answer and says, pay unto Caesars what is Caesars, and unto God that which is God needs having a little bit of a, a story and a little bit of a picture about how we deal with this idea of image. On the coin was Caesar, but our lives bear the image of God. The most amazing thing about that interaction is somewhere in that process, what happened is Jesus left his hearers with a sense of amazement with his answers. They didn't just leave going, oh, that was interesting. They didn't leave just going, oh, Oh, that was kind of cool. I think I might use that someday. They left with their jaws dropped and their lives touched. And Jesus was incredible in terms of how he addressed that particular uh, issue that was going on there. But as we take a look at this, we realize there's other winds out there too. Sometimes the winds we get caught up in are just the everyday winds. It's the person who cuts us off in traffic. It's the employee who doesn't perform the way we thought they were going to perform. It's the friend who lets us down. It's the child who doesn't do what we wanted them to do. And we find ourselves caught up in those emotional or circumstantial winds. And we find ourselves responding, not maybe as we would like, not as way we think God wants us to, but we end up responding in the midst of that emotional moment. Well, today as we walk into the scripture passage, we're going to see a great conversation about Jesus potentially getting caught up in what's called theological winds. Because as we walk into Mark chapter 12, we see that Jesus is in the midst of confrontation. And the confrontation is with the religious leaders. Last week was with a group called the Pharisees and the Herodians. Two groups that were far from each other, but came together in their common dislike of Jesus and his movement. Today we're going to see another group, and it's called the Sadducees. And this is a unique group that Jesus has the opportunity to connect with and uh, in the most he's talking with. And so we want to take a look at what this is and what he has to say for us. And I'm really calling my message this morning what I call uh, the resurrecting our walk. And I think as you walk through, you'll get a chance to see why do I, why I call it resurrecting our walk and uh, in terms of that. Now, as I mentioned this idea of getting caught up in winds, I just want to share a basic concept with you. And that's these things. Number one is when we think about how we behave in our world and why it's so important for us to spend some time talking about theology or spend some time talking about scriptural principles. Because here's how life kind of works. What we believe determines what we think. And what we think often drives how we feel and how we feel often ends up becoming our actions. And so if we have the wrong beliefs, we start thinking the wrong things about circumstances. And what's going on in this head in a circumstance will dictate how we feel and dictates how we respond. If I walk over to this young man and I stand in front of him and I look him in the eye and I raise my foot and I get a scowl on my face, and I jam my foot down on top of his toe, all 200 plus, I'm not going to tell you my weight, all 200 plus pounds of me, he looks at me, he believes that I'm being malicious, I'm being uh, nasty, I'm being mean. That determines how he thinks about me in the circumstance, it generates emotion on him, and it generates a certain response. On the other hand, if I'm in the midst of a message, and I'm getting excited, and I'm walking around, and I accidentally step on his toe with the same force. 
The reality is, it's the same amount of pain. But he believes something different about the circumstance that caused him to think differently about me. Now, he still may be frustrated with me and call me what? Irresponsible, that big blob up there, can you not stay in your space? It's bad enough I have to sit in the front row where it's the spit zone. But the reality is, he looks at the circumstance differently and he feels about it differently. In most cases, he responds differently. So that's why it's important for us to really grab a hold of some of these basic concepts and ideas because the reality is we don't want to get caught up in the winds. We want to be thinking the right things. We want to be feeling the right things. So let's open up our text and let's take a look a little bit here at the concept. And here's the concept. The concept is this. Having a hope in a promised future changes the way we walk today. So if we're going to change our perspective and we walk into life with much more hope, we think about our circumstances differently, we feel about them differently, and we act differently. And so hope is a powerful motivator in life. But let's take a look at Mark chapter 12 now, verses 17 through 28, and hear what uh, he has to say to us about this. So in Mark chapter 12, verses 18, he says this. We'll start 18. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Jesus wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. The last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, those whose wife will, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? So let's take a, a few moments and remind ourselves of some context here. We have to understand what's going on with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and understand this ultimate discussion about what we believe about something called the resurrection. Now we know as we study the Gospel of Mark, this is Jesus' only exclusive encounter with the Sadducees. Now, there were several parties and sects in Judaism in first century uh, Palestine. That they really dominated Jewish life. Those two sects were primarily um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they were represented by a group called the Sanhedrin. Both these parties seem to have arised during the Maccabean Revolt around the second century BC. And despite their having a common origin of when they came into existence, the Sadducees and the Pharisees really didn't get along. They had dramatically different beliefs. For example, the Pharisees believed in divine sovereignty, while the Sadducees affirmed human free will alone. The Pharisees believed in angels and demons, whereas the Sadducees did not. The Pharisees accepted a broader understanding of Scripture and Revelation, which for the Pharisees included both the written word, the Torah, the writings and the prophets, and the oral traditions. And here's the key. The Sadducees only accepted the written Torah, primarily the first five books written by Moses. And finally, as we see in this story, the Pharisees affirmed the resurrection of the dead, which the Sadducees expressly denied. We can look throughout the gospel and the gospel and then Acts and find out their rejection of any concept of a resurrection. They deny the existence of angels, demons, and the afterlife, and they derive every truth they had exclusively from the Torah, which they set forth. So in one sense, the Sadducees were thus the theological conservatives of the day, where the Pharisees were the progressives on social and religious matters. Now, what's interesting about the Sadducees, they comprised uh, much of the clerical and lay aristocracy. They were the kind of the leaders, the ones with all the money. And they dominated the Sanhedrin, and they were comprised of men of significant wealth. Um, they associated themselves strongly with the priesthood, and that's where their influence came from. And they were focused uh, primarily about, on the temple and all of its operations. Now, the priesthood during this time was an important part of politics as well as religious influence. The Sadducees' close alliance with the priesthood thrust them into the political fray, as we saw evidenced uh, by their receptivity to Hellenism. 
and during Jesus' day, their collaboration with the Roman rule. So even though they were the theological conservatives of the day, they made compromises for what? Power and influence and politics in terms of that. So we see that there's a conflict here, and the conflict is in the resurrection. You have the Sadducees bringing a question about what? The resurrection, even though they don't what? Believe in it. Believe in it, because they want to set up conflict with who? The Pharisees and Jesus. And so that's the picture that Jesus is walking into, and that's why it's such a trick question. Now comes to this question they raise. Where did it come from? Well, it actually is a biblical concept. It's talked about in Genesis 38, verse 8, and it's talked about in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 6. So you have to understand something. In the Levite marriage was a practice whereby a man was obligated to marry a childless widow of his brother in order to preserve the name and memory of the deceased brother and to assure the establishment of his deceased brother's property inheritance within the family. We see the first practice mentioned in Genesis chapter 38, as I mentioned. And this was the idea that a widow during that time didn't have a way to support herself. And all of her husband's inheritance could be lost by the death of him. And so the way they dealt with this was saying, well, there's a responsibility of a family member to take that woman and her children as his wife, allowing the eldest ch child, son, to carry on the name and preserve it was one of the ways in which they were trying to protect the Jewish people from intermarrying and, and uh, really getting outside the other parts of the code. So the story that arises really comes from the scriptures, the responsibility when one died. Now, this particular story, believe it or not, comes from the Apocrypha. There was a story about this guy who lost his, you know, had this continual death, of this woman who had a continual death of these spouses. And so they're kind of digging back into the Apocrypha, pulling up a story, adapting it to create conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees. Is he going to agree with the Sadducees and say there is no resurrection? Or is he going to try to, in some way, say there is a resurrection, causing difficulties in these religious groups? Do you understand the conflict? Do they really care what the answer, by the way? Are they really interested in Jesus giving a profound answer? No. This is all about how in the world can I conflict and create a problem for these people. So it is the, the winds in which they find themselves at that moment in terms of that. Let me ask you a question. We're going to dig into this resurrection story. What are some theological winds that you and I get caught up in that impact how we live our lives? that impact how we walk. And I'm talking about a theological wind, something, a belief that maybe gets in the way of us experiencing what God wants to us to experience. Here's an Old Testament one that was found in the New Testament and that still lives alive today. If I do good, God will bless me. But if I make a mistake as a Christian, God will what? He'll zap me. He'll penalize me. And we have an awful lot of bad theology out there that says the exact opposite. In fact, in Jesus' time, there was a man that had been born blind. And they were having a theological discussion because of this bad theology. And the disciples were trying to figure out, hey... This man was born blind, therefore either he sinned in the womb or his mom and dad sinned. And the reason he was blind is, was because of what? His sin or his mom's sin. That's how radical it occurred. When Job in the Old Testament found himself losing everything, Job was a wealthy, powerful, influential man. When he lost everything, including his marriage, his health, his children, everything that he obtained, his friends gathered around and said to him, the reason you're going through bad things is because you've sinned against God. That's bad theology. Job was going through those things for what reason? 
that the glory of God may be revealed in his life. What did Jesus say to his disciples? No, it wasn't his parents that sinned, and it wasn't him he had sinned in the womb. It's that the glory of God may be revealed in his healing. Yes, sin ultimately causes these things to happen, but the primary thing is not connected to our individual behavior. Sin happens, the consequences of sin are out there, and the impact of the world. But what are some other bad theological positions we have? Here's another one. If we think God is primarily concerned with our self-esteem, we think that's God's number one concern, is our self-esteem. We'll structure our lives and habits in a way that encourages us to think more highly of ourselves than we are. You know how we do that in Scripture, don't we? Love your neighbor as your what? Self, and we twist that. The reason Jesus gave that particular scripture verse is because it was assumed we have a natural what? Love for self. But we've twisted that to say, well, no, no, what that means, you can't love anybody else to truly love yourself. And we have some bad theology out there that teaches us to get enamored with ourselves. If we think Christ died to secure our comfort and happiness, we will waste our time and talents on temporary pleasurable things and have a short expiration date rather than on things of an eternal significance. We think this whole Christian experience is about God making us happy in the moment, then we become short-term investors. And we're unwilling to invest in the long-term things of God. If we don't believe what is true about the character of God, we don't have a sufficient standard for our thoughts, words, and actions toward others. When we misunderstand God's hatred of sin, we will wrongly encourage others to sin the same in the name of love. When we forget God's love, we will grant people kindness only when they, we feel they deserve it. When we undervalue God's grace, we will push others to earn right standing, either in his eyes or our own, through perfect behavior. We don't understand the truth about God's sovereignty and his love. We will be thrown to and fro by the power of our pain, but if we have a biblical perspective on God's character and power, we'll be able to join Charles Spurgeon in saying, I have learned to kiss the waves that throw me against the rock of ages. Do you see how theological winds can grab a hold of us? Do you see theological winds going through the Christian community and the church today? Where we get lost and we get swept away from the original tent that God wanted us to have. And so we see a very powerful uh, perspective here in terms of it. Well, let's take a look at this idea of Hope has a powerful impact in our everydays. Because it really does. It has a powerful impact in our everydays. And I want you to take a look at the rest of the scripture passage. So this question is raised. It's a question that's grounded in the Old Testament. It's a question that's grounded in the conflict between the Sadducees and the Pharisees and their disagreement of the resurrection. The actual idea for the storyline comes from the Apocrypha. They have been pretty clever in presenting this question to Jesus. Let's see how Jesus answers the question. Here's what he says. Are you not an heir because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? Don't you love how he just gets right to the point? This conflict that you have between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, this question you're raising to me, it comes about because you, have, you don't accept the scriptures. You ignore it. Uh, you can imagine them being offended, couldn't you? The Sadducees? You must be talking about the Pharisees, right? We're, we're the pure ones. We accept only the writings of the Torah. We only accept the writings primarily of the first five books of Moses. It's the Pharisees, by the way, who have extra beliefs that are connected to tradition and oral traditions. Not the Sadducees. But Jesus says, you don't understand the scriptures. You don't understand the power of God. And he goes on and says, when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like angels in heaven. And so he's talking about there is a resurrection. And he says that that existence, though it bears resemblance to what we have today, will be dramatically different. It's not just going to be a continuation of what we have in this world with just a little bit better high. It's like, I don't really like watching some of the TV evangelists from when I was growing up as a kid. They would try to give you a picture of the blessing of God, and it was a gaudy set. It was a gaudy set that was supposedly, you know, gold and those types of things displayed. 
this existence that God has for us isn't just a little bit better than the world in which we live. Everything has changed. In fact, even relationships are changed. I will know Christy, but our relationships are so changed and transformed that it will not be like it is here where I will be married to Christy in heaven. Jesus clearly communicates that, telling us there's a qualitative difference in that, and that was to challenge the Pharisees who believed in the resurrection, but were trying to say it just was a continuation of the world that we have here upon the earth. He says, now about the dead rising. Have you not read in the book of who? Moses. So he, he's going right after him, isn't he? You only accept the writings of Moses. That's all you accept. That's all you want to pay attention to. Well, let me quote Moses for you. He says, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush? Remember the story we're talking about here? Moses grew up in Pharaoh's household. He thinks he's the deliverer. He kills an Egyptian. He's forced to flee. He spends 40 years in the wilderness. God breaks him down, and now he's ready to be used by God. And God speaks to him through a burning bush in the, in the book of Exodus. And he gives to him a particular uh, identity of who he is. He says, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. What, what's he doing here? What's he saying? I gave promises to Abraham. I gave promises that need to be fulfilled in Isaac's life. I gave promises that need to be fulfilled in Jacob's life. I am the present eternal God, have given that promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who are physically dead. But guess what? The promises are still alive because they will be resurrected. He's saying, I wouldn't give a promise to a dead person. I only give a promise to a live person. And so he uses the book of Moses back on them. And that's why I have this equation. Here's how it adds up for Jesus. You're a Sadducee. You look for everything from the Moses. You go to a, 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 a pivotal experience, Moses being called on the burning bush, and you go to that powerful phrase, who, who are you? I am. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God who's made promises that is yet to fulfill in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's life. When you add that all together, it comes that there is a reality of a resurrection that's coming down the road. That there is something more to this world and this life in which we find ourselves. But why do I raise this with us for? Because I really believe we can't afford to live hopeless lives as followers of Christ. It's this time and season where I see a lot of it. We're so focused on watching what's happening on cable news and listening to politicians speak either good or bad about circumstances. We hear people talking about what's good about our country, what's bad about our country. We hear all these voices coming up. We get all these flyers in the mail and people knocking on our doors. And before long, we can become rather what? Hopeless about our world. What if November 5th doesn't go the way you think it should go? Are you gonna walk around, put your hands in your knees? and say all is lost because your side, your person didn't win? Or do you have a hope of something greater? That doesn't just change you after November 5th, but changes how you walk today and the manner in which you do things. Because here's what hopelessness looks like for believers. When you feel hopeless in a circumstance, that's why I asked you to identify it. You feel all alone, don't you? you? You feel a little bit like King David, open the Psalms up. How did most of the Psalms start? Oh God, my enemies surround me. I'm all alone. I'm all by myself. Where are you, oh God? Where are the people that support me? Or as I like to say from my song as a kid, um, uh, um, the worms in their song. Nobody likes, me. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Why don't I eat some worms? Long, slender, slimy ones. Short, fat, and juicy ones. Itty bitty, fuzzy, wuzzy worms. Down goes the first one, down goes the second one. Oh, how they wiggle with a squirm. Long, slender, slimy one, short, fat, and juicy one. Ditty bitty, fuzzy, wuzzy worms. 
Mom, I don't feel so good. Up come the first one, up come the second one. Oh, how they wiggle in this world. I mean, don't we begin to feel like that? We walk around, we have no hope. We believe that life is confined to what I'm experiencing at the moment. Life is confined to what happens between the time of my birth to my death. It can be rather a lonely experience. Or we have feelings of shame and guilt. Hey, I gotta tell you, you got a story. And I'm glad when you share your testimony with me, but I'm guessing you're like me. There are parts of your testimony that are just between you and God. Hey, let me give you a hint here. You still sin. You still do dumb things. You still get caught up in things. And if you don't trust in what God has done and his promises and the promise of the resurrection being fulfilled by what Jesus did upon a cross, you carry around what? Shame and guilt. God can't forgive me. And we feel beaten down. We feel broken. We have no passion, positive expectations, or enthusiasm. I don't know what's going to happen November 5th. Who cares? I do care. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the determiner of my joy. It's not the determiner of my ministry. It's not determining what God, who God's called me to be, what God's called me to do. Our walk isn't determined by when, who wins an election. Our walk isn't determined by whether everything's going good or things are going bad at the moment. Our walk is determined by the fact that we know what God has provided for us. I'm a fellow heir with Christ. I know what my inheritance is. It's everything Jesus has secured. Everything that is his, he is sharing with me. He's made me that fellow heir. Lack of faith. God, I can't trust you. How can I trust you, God? Gloom and despair that gets expressed in anger and frustration and bitterness. That's what it means to walk around if this is all that life is. I gotta tell you, if this is all that life is, life is unfair. Because that is the truth, isn't it? Why do some people get born in certain families and have all the opportunities? Why do some people get blessed with good looks? I mean, some of us didn't get blessed with good looks. But why did God bless some in some ways and others in other ways? What's the great equalizer? It's called the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our resurrection where everything is made new and everything is complete in terms of that. And so we take a look at this whole concept. God calls us to live lives of hope. He calls us to be those who grab a hold of the truth of God's word and his promises and live them out even if we won't experience them until he returns and he establishes his kingdom forever and ever. Amen. That's what it means. That's what Abraham did. That's what Isaac did. That's what Jacob did. That's what Moses did. That's what King David did. That's what the apostles did. They had a first fruits as the apostle called the Holy Spirit, but they still awaited and longed. Look at Paul writing in the book of Philippians. He says, I long to be with you, Lord, but I may have to stay here for the sake of ministry. But it'd be far better if I go with you. That was Paul's perspective. So let me ask you this question. Where in your life do you need the life of Christ, the promises of God, to be you, for there to be a resurrection? Where are you down and gloomy and depressed about? It may even be because of your own stupidity or disobedience or lack of discipline. Where is that area in life that you just feel exhausted? I gotta tell you something. Through the promises of God and the hope that awaits us because we know there is a resurrection, God wants to create an empty tomb experience for you. You know what happened when the women and the disciples went and saw the empty tomb. What happened? They were filled with excitement, filled with passion. They were overwhelmed because they knew that God kept his word. God wants to walk into some of those dead despairing areas of our life. And he wants to resurrect our walk with his promises. 
know what the most amazing thing is? It's not that you and I have easier lives than those who don't have Jesus. It's not that you and I have a never have problems because we have this gold card that God gave us because we happen to follow him. No. It's that in the midst of all that, we know that's not the end of the story. We know there's always coming a resurrection day. When even that injustice, that pain, that disappointment, that lack of healing, whatever it may be, is going to be set aright by Christ when he returns. Isn't that exciting? I want you to have that hope. I want to make sure that you know Jesus. And that no matter what you're walking through, you have the opportunity to watch him change you in the moment, even if your circumstances don't change. Because you know there's something more that God has in store for you. Remember I talk about this all the time? Where are you in relationship to where Christ can touch your life? Remember we use those five things? What are they? What's the first step? The step of what? Unconcern. Well, you're probably not there because you're here today. The unconcerned people, they just don't care. They may know a lot about God or they may know what? Nothing about God. They just don't care. But sometimes something happens in their life. It could be an experience at work, something in the family. It could just be even a health scare or just aging. And all of a sudden you start thinking about God and you move up to what step? The step of concern. You start thinking about God. You think about coming to church, you start reading the word, maybe going to a Bible study. You have some questions about life and death and where you fit in all of this. And you move up to that concern step. And sometimes in the midst of the concern step, as you open up God's word, you open yourself up to his truth, you start to feel a little uncomfortable with the way you're living your life. And that moves you up to what step? Step of conviction. Which is nothing more than what? Spiritual discomfort. Oh, man. I had these questions, I started going to church, started going to a Bible study, now God's speaking to me, and I realized some of the ways in which I'm living my life don't match up with him, and I feel uncomfortable. And sometimes we feel so uncomfortable, we move up to the step of what? Repentance. What's repentance? Whoa, this doesn't feel good. We start to reform our behavior. We start to change. It's called a spiritual U-turn. Now here's the key. Whether it's unconcerned, concerned, convicted, or repentant, that person has yet to become a Christian. They may look like one on the outside. They may have all the behaviors on the exterior. No, it takes the last step. And the last step is faith in Christ. And that's where you say, Lord, no matter how hard I try, no matter how hard I grit my teeth, no matter how many times I read your word or Bible studies I go to, I realize I never can do enough and I can't deal with my past. And God, I continually fail. So I'm just going to take this mess of a life, all that it is, and I'm going to trust you with it. I'm going to trust you to become the leader of my life. I'm going to try to follow you. But most importantly, I'm going to trust you to be what we call the Savior of my life. I'm going to trust you your work, your performance, your death on my behalf, because I know I can't do it. And we give our life, commit our life to Jesus. And that's when the Spirit of God comes inside of us. And we become a believer. And that's when we have the opportunity for God to create those resurrection experiences in our life in the everyday. Following Christ is simple as ABC. Number one, admit our need. Did I say number one? Letter A, admit our need. <laughs> Letter B, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who lived the life you couldn't live, died the death you deserved, and rose again to the resurrection so long for. And number three, commit your life to him, making him the leader and the forgiver of your sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this.